Hey guys, um, my name is Robert Snell. I'm going to be your moderator for tonight. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the university for allowing us to have this event. I also want to thank our debaters for participating. They put in a massive amount of time and effort getting ready for this debate and are prepared to do battle for us tonight. Lastly, I want to thank you guys, the students, for making this possible. Tonight our debaters are students. The moderator is a student. And you guys, most of you I would assume are students. This is a student-led event, and the significance of that cannot be understated. The fact that our generation is beginning to take on these great political debates is something that should empower us. Our organization, Students for Liberty, believes in freedom of expression, intellectual inquiry, and the free market of ideas. We believe that freedom is the necessary basis of a society in order for the individual to grow and prosper into their full potential. This event cannot happen if we didn't live in a free society. Our organization has hosted many events on campus before, but I'm thinking this will be the most exciting event we'll yet. So, let's get into it. The resolution for tonight's debate is capitalism is the most benevolent and efficient economic system ever conceived by man. Oh, by me. Uh, again, capitalism is the most benevolent and efficient economic system ever conceived by man. Our debaters tonight are some of the best and brightest students on our campus. Arguing the affirmative for pro side is Christian Watson. He is a sophomore here at Mercer University and the president of Students for Liberty on Mercer's campus. As a freelance writer, he has, Mr. Mr. Watson has published it numerously, numerous nationally acclaimed outlets such as USA Today, The Washington Examiner, Townhall.com, and many, many more. His primary goal is to, in his words, raise the level <coughs> of discourse on campus and take that ambition to the world through his political commentary. Arguing the negative or the con side of David Stokes. David is a senior here at Mercer University pursuing a double major in international affairs and religion. He was a 2018 research fellow at the McDonald Center for American, America's Founding Principles and is currently on the board of the Palestine Museum and Human Rights Center in Cape Town, South Africa. He is the founder and chairman of Mercer Students for Justice in Palestine and has gr grassroots activist experience among marginalized country communities in Lebanon, Morocco, and Algeria. He is also a Fulbright semi-finalist in Bahrain and intends to pursue a career in academia. So, now that we know the debater is a little bit better, let's talk about how this debate's gonna go. We're gonna start out with an affirmative and opening argument by Christian, which will be eight minutes long. After that, we'll have a three-minute cross-examination by David, followed by his opening argument, which will be eight minutes, which will then be um, followed by cross-examination by Christian. After that, we'll have our rebuttal starting with Christian and ending with David. And each rebuttal will be about four minutes. Um, Q&A will be after that, and that'll be 40 minutes approximately. So if the debaters finish their arguments before time is up, they may yield their time. If they go over the time limit, they may finish their thought, but then we have to move on. Uh, so we will start with Christian whenever you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. All, right, cool. All right, everyone. Uh, first, let me thank each and every one of you for making this exodus here, this academic exodus, on this very rainy Wednesday night. I know there are probably 10,000 things you can do, and that's probably better than this, but the fact that you uh, came to uh, hear both of us speak speaks very highly to your academic integrity and to your willingness to grow and learn as an individual. I must also thank Mr. Zell here for taking the time out to prepare for this night and to moderate and to you know, get all this together. I must thank David, who is, as I, I've always said, my opponent in intellect, but my brother in spirit. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and doing this. I am forever grateful. I think when I first thought of this resolution and, 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 I, 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 and I considered its implications, I, I thought of the ideas that folks tend to have when it comes to capitalism. And those ideas, I think, tend to be necessarily flawed. The premise actually tends to be flawed. When you think of capitalism, and I was just in Iowa not too long ago, and I listened to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren rant on about how businesses are supposedly ripping off the, the consumer and they're using accruing political power to uh, you know, advance their own interests at the expense of the competitors. And they call that a crime of capitalism. In fact, Cornell West, who's an academic and one of the most actually renowned academic socialists in America, calls this a sort of a, 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 a crisis of dignity that, um, that, that capitalism permits for. But what I, and what I want to start with in this debate, what I know in their critiques, they are almost always never critiquing capitalism itself. In fact, it's quite interesting. They are critiquing an inversion, a perversion perhaps, 
of the capitalistic mindset and the capitalist framework, which which is which has been a lot permitted to flourish in society by and through uh, government intervention. We call this perversion crony capitalism. So essentially, for those of you who don't know, crony capitalism is any any action, so to speak, in which the government gets itself involved in voluntary exchanges between individuals with actual capital and perverts them and directs them towards a certain a, towards someone else's advantage. Uh, whereas in a capitalist system. Folks actually engage in voluntary exchanges, and the advantage is to the to he or she who produces the best product. When you hear a critique of capitalism, when you when you hear a critique of monopolies, when you hear a critique of inequality, when you hear a critique of anything that would appear to be intrinsic to the capitalist system, you are instead hearing a critique of crony capitalism. You are never, ever, very rarely hearing a critique of actual capitalism as it was conceptualized, as it was thought of, and as it has been actualized and materialized in various, various different instances across the world throughout the history of the world. Um, and so that's where really the resolution is made. When we actually talk about capitalism as it is, not as, of, as, as, it, as it is now, how it should be, not as it has been made, we actually get evidence of a system that has worked for a lot of folks, and that is the best engine for humans, for through human version. So the first part of the resolution, if I'm not mistaken, says capitalism is the most benevolent of that part second, because that part is actually, I think, intrinsic to the latter part, efficient. Capitalism is the most efficient economic system known, known to man. I would tell you, if you look at any point in history, particularly before the Industrial Revolution, you will never find any phenomenon that has created more wealth and more value for people, or more ways for people to measure value and wealth than the capitalist system had. In fact, if you look at before the Industrial Revolution, what you will see, you will see centuries upon centuries upon centuries of abject poverty, not just poverty of materials, because that's, that, that's precisely what actually Marx is concerned about, but you see power, uh, a sort of spiritual poverty, a power that manifests in different ways, a power that manifests in the, uh, in, in the form of hostility between groups, because one has something and one doesn't have. A poverty that manifests in the form of control over certain products or certain resources, because one has a product, that product and one does not have the product in, in, in such, you know, uh, in such uh, abundance. You, you see an attempt to control and manufacture human aims and human goals towards certain ends. And that this is what's understood these days as the command economy. And in these systems, you have always seen the, 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 the natural concept of scarcity take over. You have always seen that even though indeed these systems where tyrants go in and they command folks to produce things, whether it be the kings in England, whether it be even the colonists before they went up against King George and overthrew him and when the capitalist revolution actually happened, which I'll get to in a moment, you will always see a drought, a, a sort of misuse in human energy and human potential. But the moment individuals were given the tools to actually do what they wanted to do, to create value in their own ways, and to create value in between people, not in between institutions, that is when you have, you saw, and you have seen the glory of the capitalist system. So I would challenge anyone, and including Mr. Stokes, to produce to me a single system prior to the Industrial Revolution, which has created as much value, the capacity to create value, not in just value in the material sense, but also in the sense of being able to have property, being able to use that property to uh, accrue value as well. And has created the most community enrichment than capitalism has, you will find none, but it does not exist. And so, and even if you look at today, even though I would, I'm going to argue that a lot of our capitalist system today is not necessarily capitalism in its pure form, you see a lot of aspects of capitalism, indeed, in today's economy. I mean, you see voluntary exchanges. In fact, the fact that I'm here at Mercer is a voluntary exchange. I decided that I was going to purchase the services of the university to cultivate my, my, my standing as an individual. I decided that I was going to get educated, and that's a value to me, and I use that value in my exchange, and therefore I'm here. That is a capitalistic construct. That is a construct that may not have been invented by capitalism, but only came into being because of the advent of the capitalist system. You even see this in, uh, whenever you go to the grocery store, you are trying to get Value. The value is obviously the food or whatever you need, and the person who's providing the food gets value, gets value from your service, so on and so forth. So even in today's very muck, very proxy even poisonous, perhaps even, even disturbed, you know, warped, necromantic idea of what capitalism actually is, you are seeing, I think, 
you you are you, you are seeing um you're seeing the uh, you're seeing the risk capitalism come forward. And so benevolence. This is the part where folks oftentimes get upset or folks oftentimes misunderstand. People wonder how in the world could capitalism possibly be benevolent. You have a bunch of people at the top. It's what Bernie says, Bernie Sanders says, who's running president of the United States. You have the one percent and the ninety-nine percent are are you know are, are, are being are being crushed. And Marx said you have the bourgeoisie which are crushed in the proletariat. It's like in almost every critique of capitalism, it's always put in terms of aggression. It's always put in terms of conflict. It's always put in terms of us versus them, or them versus you, or versus group. But you never. But, but what is lost in that assessment is the is what capitalism actually allows individuals to do outside of that framework. For so, let me give an example. In Greenwood, Tulsa, which was called the Black Wall Street. Those of you who are students of Black history will know this very well. There was an and there was a former slave colony, a former a former a freed slave went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is very racist in the early 20th century in its own right. And he decided, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let this era, this environment of Jim Crow crush me. I'm not going to let this sort of these these police officers. I'm not going to let all of it destroy my spirit. So he got a lot of other African American folks together, and through free enterprise, through trading, through capitalism, they effectively created one of the most prosperous towns in the history of America, or in the history of America at that time. They owned taxi services, they owned restaurants, they owned all the airports in Tulsa's, all the, they might as well own an airport, they owned all the airplanes in Tulsa's airport. They completely and utterly used the capitalist system to unlock their greatness. So to me, this debate is not, not merely about who is against who. This debate is what is for you, and in my opinion, and that's why I act from your resolution. Capitalism is 100% for you and for your capacity for greatness. I look forward to a very boisterous debate tonight. Right, now we're going to do a cross examination. Thank you. So, Christian, I do have uh, several questions okay. um, for you based on your opening statements. Um, you gave us a lot of information about what you think crony capitalism is, but I couldn't really pin down a definition of what true capitalism is. Um, just a clarification for me and for the audience, what, how would you define capitalism and its so true capitalism? Any un so, yeah, so, so just so that it wasn't clear, you guys could understand anyway, a true capitalism is any unfettered exchange of goods, services, or values. Goods, services, or values between, between consenting parties. That's what true capitalism is. Now, of course, of course, there are more material sort of um, uh, implications to that. Of course, there are more things that manifest upon that principle. But that is the basis. That is the foundation of the principle. Not the entire principle, but the foundation of the principle. In, in that case, I would wonder then what distinguishes the modern capitalist system based on, uh, as you say, unfair exchange between consenting parties from the market as it has always existed. It seems to me, historically speaking, any time a human society, or humans have existed in society together, there has been a medium of exchange of basic goods. Either through bartering, um, or through fiat currency more recently, in a store for memory, there's always been exchange between uh, different parties. Um, but you seem to want to distinguish capitalism as it exists today from previous historical systems. But it seems to me that a market has always existed uh, since societies have existed. So what distinguishes capitalism from the markets that has uh, pre-existed most societies? So the question you're really asking is, is capitalism kind of a priori? And my, and my answer is that it doesn't really matter. We're arguing that capitalism as it is right now is, it, it is, the, most, is the best system as existed of all systems that have existed. Every system you're talking about, whether it be mercantile or whatever it may be, every system, was predicated upon that free exchange of goods and uh, exchange of goods and values, and capitalism quite literally and uh, in, uh, quite literally embodies the highest order of those previous systems. But why? But you ask, how is capitalism? How is capitalism today different than the concept of market exchange in general? I tell you, there's regulations. There's regulations. So the, 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 the government's like, if you look at 2008, the government quite literally bailed out banks who they enabled and allowed to jack up home for, uh, to like jack down home prices and people who bought home, who bought homes couldn't afford them, which caused the housing prices. You have um, numerous other things. You have price controls in various areas. You have rent controls in various areas, which hurt producers. I mean, there are 
an innumerable amount of ways in which the current government, the current system is absolutely antithetical to the spirit of capitalism. You just, I wouldn't have time to list them now. Uh, sort of along the line of my first question, could you define what you mean by efficiency? I, meant, I, I wrote down that you mentioned the production of wealth, the production of value, and that somehow because capitalism has produced uh, the highest degree of wealth in the time based on previous systems is therefore more efficient. What does that mean? Uh, that more wealth uh, uh, means more efficiency. So I didn't say more wealth means more efficiency. I said that wealth is a product of efficiency, which is two different things. Um, so, but I think that wealth is certainly an indicator of uh, how good the efficiency is. Because you need for every input you need an output. For every standard, you need, a, you need an opposite standard. For darkness, you need light. For, for heaven, you need hell. Right? For goodness, you need bad. And so essentially, for efficiency, you need slowness or inefficiency. And so we, we measure efficiency by how fast, how quick, and how better, how best a certain thing is being prepared. A thing can be a product, a thing can be a value, a thing can be whatever you want to, want to be. If it can be exchanged with someone else, efficiency comes to the equation. Does that answer your question? Now we'll move into the opening round. <coughs> uh, can anyone hear me or should I use the microphone? So the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci basically said that intellectuals and debate between intellectuals uh, form a really important part of the struggle between workers uh, and the uh, capitalist class. And basically the class struggle is reduced down to a struggle of ideas. And so in the spirit of the struggle between ideas, I am very gracious for Christian Watson uh, as a competing intellectual whom I respect very greatly. And I respect uh, the audience and thank you for coming here tonight uh, to engage in a very thriving intellectual uh, conversation. And I hope uh, that your uh, intellectual uh, drive is furthered by tonight's discussion. Um, I recognize that the task before me tonight is not the easiest task in the world. Like many of you, I've lived my entire life in a capitalist society, and to me, uh, or at least to many of you, and it did to me until recently, uh, the virtues of capitalism seem almost self-evident. Uh, to many of you, capitalism uh, may seem as the inevitable conclusion of human development, or the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama uh, might say, and as Christian Watson in his opening statements uh, alluded to, that capitalism is somehow the pinnacle of human development, and we are basically at the end uh, of history, as I said. And yet, here I am tonight to dispel three major uh, myths of capitalism, and to demonstrate on capitalism's own terms that capitalism cannot uh, you know, cannot fulfill the promises that capitalism promises to fulfill, and that it actually does not lead to the free expression of the individual and the free development of the individual. But first, before I get into my major opening and my main uh, arguments, I want to explain some of the key terms in this resolution as I see them, that way uh, there's no confusion as to what I am talking about uh, during my opening statement. So by capitalism, uh, I'm referring to an economic system whose, or which, uh, in which the driving purpose, the driving uh, reason of being is the endless accumulation of capital or profit. I'll use profit and capital interchangeably in my opening statements. And I regard any system as benevolent, uh, which allows for the free and unhindered development and expression of the individual. Uh, in my definition and line of thinking, any system that is coercive cannot be uh, benevolent, since that would restrict the free expression and development of the individual. And so, let's begin. The first myth that I want to discuss is that capitalists often claim uh, that their economic system is the only economic system that can uh, fairly compensate workers for their labor. They say that wages are determined by the markets, and thus that wages are a fair and accurate reflection of the value added by labor to the, uh, to the markets. And this is simply not true, uh, in my opinion. The value added by labor to a commodity or to a product is always less than the wage the worker 
um, receives, and the reason is quite simple. The value of the, uh, the owner of the business, the capitalist, must always make the profits. But if you look at the way products are created, the only creation of value in the production system is the worker who changes raw materials into a commodity. By applying labor to the raw material, value is created. And so the profit is the difference between the wage given the worker and the actual value of the work. Most production lines, every production line, has a capitalist who buys raw materials, hands it over to a worker, the worker changes uh, that material into something valuable, adds value to the material, and then the uh, capitalist sells that um, final product for profit. And this profit, as I said, is the difference between the wage of the worker and the actual value of the work that she contributed. And so the worker in this case is not fairly compensated and can never be fairly compensated. Um, they are exploited. And exploitation, or as I prefer to call it, theft, uh, is coercive by nature. And to have uh, the value added to a product stolen from the worker is not benevolent and is not conducive to the um, free expression of that individual's well-being. And this is not just a theoretical argument. I know this is, I'm making an economic argument here, and it is quite theoretical, but the data does support my claim. According to the Economic Policy Institute, uh, the productivity of the American worker between 1979 and 2018 increased on average by 70%. During the same time period, uh, the average wage of the American worker only increased by 11%. So productivity increased by 70%, but wages have stagnated and have only increased by 11%. So clearly, uh, wages are not fairly reflective of the value contributed by the worker to the marketplace. Someone uh, is being stolen from, right? and it is, uh, in my opinion, the workers. Myth number two is that capitalism champions the free market, and this is something that all of you have heard, and it's probably the most surprising thing that I'm going to say that it's not true. Capitalism does not favor uh, the free market. And by free market, I mean the standard capitalist economic idea of competition. It's conditioned with a multitude of buyers, a multitude of sellers, free entry and exit into the market, and perfect exchange of information among all the parties um, involved. In standard capitalist economic thought, I'm not using Marxist thought here, capitalist thought tells us uh, that in the long term, profits in a free market are zero. So capitalists must engineer a system where the short term uh, is not allowed to develop into the long term and somehow distort the market. And one of the most obvious ways that they distort the market is through the division of capital the division of property. If only one class of people controls the means of production, and one class of people does not, then those people who do not have the means of production, that is a barrier to them for entering into the free market, and the market ceases to be free. So I would argue that in a system of property that we have uh, in this country, where there is a disparity in property, the market can never be free, as those who do not have property or have less than others can never fully participate as producers in the economic system. Uh, the third myth that I want to speak about comes from the second, and that is that capitalists want little to no state intervention in the economy, and this is uh, quite frankly not true. A basic introduction to political theory demonstrates that uh, the foundation of modern, uh, modern classical liberal thought, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, Thomas Hobbes, they all believed and this is uh, true today, that the state is designed uh, to defend private property, to defend the division of capital, and to defend um, capitalism. And this is one of the ways that they maintain an unfree market or a quasi-monopolized market, is by state intervention into the economy to guarantee short-term profits. Uh, so we have things like patents, subsidies, tariffs, taxations, uh, judicial action, and occasionally uh, direct armed intervention into the economy and into society to preserve the political power, the profits, and the hegemony of the elite capitalist class. Capitalists have never really in principle been opposed to the intervention of the states into the economy. They have always favored um, state intervention when it preserves their power and oppresses the majority of individuals who are desiring to uh, express their aspirations and act on them. Uh, my time is running out, so I want to speak briefly about efficiency. Um, the richest 
1% of the world, according to the Oxfam Institute, has as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. To me, this is an inefficiency in the system. 795 million people worldwide suffer from chronic hunger. This is not an efficient way to allocate resources if this is the case. One third of all childhood deaths under five are caused by malnutrition. This, uh, definitionally, I think, is a major inefficiency of the system in how we allocate resources. In the United States alone, 16 million people forgo healthcare because they cannot afford it. This is a major inefficiency. So, in closing, capitalism actually restricts the free development and expression uh, of the individual. The product of labor is alien uh, to the worker, that is, the worker does not, uh, what the worker produces is not owned by the worker. Under capitalism, social relationships are mediated by the exchange of commodities, by the exchange of products, and life loses its uniquely human character. It becomes purely concerned with subsistence. Work is forced by necessity in this instance, and individuals are reduced to mere cards in an ever-functioning, ever-expanding, ever-grinding machine. This is the definition, I think, of a collectivist economy, where the individual does not matter. If you are a card in a machine, you do not matter. And so the capitalist economy may simply be the greatest collectivist institution in human history. Thank you. All right, we'll now move into cross-examination. What is ownership? What is ownership? <laughs> Are you talking about uh, ownership or talking about property? Well, what I was getting to is that the, the two are one and the same. Mm -hmm. right. I, I, I would agree with that. And for me, uh, ownership okay. is that. So, okay. I would reject. Uh, any system where there is uh, private property and ownership, particularly of the means of production, because I favor uh, an absolute free market. Sure, sure, okay. All right, so this is a very broad horn esque sort of libertarian socialist argument that capitalism and markets are separate, and it, it's, it comes from the same source and it just doesn't make sense. But I'll this. If ownership, if, if you want people to own their labor, if you're saying ownership is theft, how does that necessarily sort of click under your system? There seems to be an inconsistency to <clears throat> I would uh, respond to this question that human beings have an essential essence, uh, species beings, so to speak. And this, uh, basically, it, it's what separates us as individuals from animals. Um, and can you give Christian one thing that's so I can get this long uh, response? Um, <laughs> because humans have an essence, and this essence is work, we are separated by individuals Oh, sorry, we're separated uh, from animals by our proclivity to work. Not just uh, to work for profit, to work for other means, or to work for wages, or working for subsistence. Work as an inherently creative process. And so I envision a system uh, in which work is done purely for creative means. Any work done for substance, for subsistence, uh, or for literature, or for any sort of necessity is forced and compelled. What I'm... By whom? By, by whom? Yes, who's forcing or compelling me to, to get food for myself, other than myself? <clears throat> I, there is a difference between subsistence and creative work. Of course, we share in common uh, with animals, a species being of uh, working and producing for ourselves and for nutrition. I'm not going to... Uh, entertain a notion or advance a notion that we don't need to work for our uh, nutrition, for our um, energy, etc. But animals do that as well. And I, so, and I would argue that we, we are animals, but we are distinct from animals. Yes. We have an essence, which is intelligent, we have reason, yes. But I, I don't think that reason, I think that let me, let me back up a little bit. Work is the product of our reason and ought to be creative. If we are working to suit our animal needs, if we are working to meet the basic needs of energy and substance, then we're not using our reason in that case. 
Now we, we can use reason to maximize that sort of economic production to meet our basic needs. But I believe in creation for creation's sake. And I believe that is what human, that, that's what sets up what humans is on animals. And so my, my major problem with, with capitalism really is that it forces individuals to work for the animal primal needs. It prohibits workers um, because they're not, they don't actually own what they produce, they're not actually able to do all that advice beyond this. They're not, they're not receiving the fair value for the other contributions and not able to um, use their, their productions for the creative work. They're using the work on behalf of someone else and receiving only a very small portion of them. So I think I just heard you say um, that reason, that our reason would tell us not to work for subsistence. And if you accept the maxim, I'm not sure what you do, that every individual is motivated by their self-interest, then when something that's basic and primal is giving food or water or drink or whatever, necessarily be a priori come before our reason has to come into the equation. Now, if our reason does come into the equation, would it necessarily mean that our reason is going to help us to well live naturally? Of course, you have to be alive to express yourself as an individual and to express your reason. But there is more to feeding yourself and getting through the basic necessities of life than, I'm sorry, there's more to life than simply um, working for a subsistence wage, working to feed yourself, working to, uh, to uh, simply provide yourself. Humans, uh, uh, I believe, are called to a higher purpose beyond this, to utilize our reasons and reasons sake, to engage in a productive, um, creative work, this is what gives humans meaning. Not meeting our animal needs, and not being completely restrained and um, enslaved to our desires, to allow our reason to overcome our animal needs, and to do something truly creative. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So now we're going to move into the bubbles, uh, starting with Christian. Um, so, I must say, uh, that was a, a brilliant exercise I've ever, uh, really, I, I haven't really heard a better exercise I've ever done myself. And I think that there are even, beyond, there are some very important things to consider. The idea of essence. Aristotle would say that the thing that distinguishes the human being between the animal would be the reason that's just located in our consciousness, right? And the spiritualists would say that we are a actively trying to engage and lift our con con consciousness through enlightened frequencies. And so I think there's a very good point to that, but I think the system that David is advocating for is absolutely antithetical and anathema to anything to do with human creativity and expression. Have you seen a government-made product? Have you seen anything that was made by a central planning com committee which were all under the auspices and the frameworks of communistic or Marxist thought, which is what you're propagating right now? Have you seen, it's terrible. And the problem with that is, the problem with that is, if they always run out of resources because they never produce resources. This idea that the worker is pigeonholed to anyone because he works works for someone, when in all reality, I think that the idea that I work for someone is merely a product of our industrial mindset. The true capitalistic idea is that I work with someone. Everything is a voluntary exchange. And that's actually part of the problem I was talking about with you earlier. The problem of us having a crony capitalistic system, which leads into our mindsets and makes us think these things that are not true. That makes us embody these bit of pagan ideas that makes me think that I'm some sort of slave to someone, and that's not true. And the reason Marx thought that, the reason Marx thought that was primarily because he saw every last thing within a dichotomy of materialism. The dialectic of materialism that he got from Hegel, he transported that from Hegelianism and then brought that over, him and Engels brought that over, and you know, had, and, and sort of tailored it to the pains of the working class in that time, because there were certainly pains, but their pains were merely exasperated by, by that sort of materialistic nonsense. So this idea that the worker works for someone is nonsense. The worker does not work for someone. The worker works with someone, and that's what they're valued at. This claim that you make, that productivity is not equal wages, you, I, I, I think in a sense that is correct in a principal sense. So, because if I am a janitor, and I am working at, I don't know, $11 an hour cleaning floors, 
I'm not, no matter how many hours I put in, I'm never going to make as enough money as a neurosurgeon in the ER who's operating on brain, brain patients and taking out tumors. Of course. Just because productivity goes up does not necessarily mean that wages will go up, and does not necessarily mean that people are being harmed. That just means people have different skill sets, David. This is what Marx did not understand. Marx had no conception of differences. He only saw bourgeoisie, proletariat, us versus them. He did not see individuals. And so when you lose that essence, as you, as you so rightly said, that essence that focuses on individualism, you will never be able to understand capitalism and its true root. And that's what's happening right here. We don't understand it. It's, 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 it, 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 it's, it's a shame, it's a shame. Because this idea that someone is necessarily being taken advantage of, or there's some sort of unfairness, because they have a different skill set, that's, that's almost intellectual thuggery almost. It's the same idea that Marx used to rouse up the masses, thing that the living is rouse the masses against people, some from folks who were very, you know, very nefarious, you know, uh, this bizarre in Russia was very nefarious, you know, all very nefarious, but they provided the wrong solution. And so I believe he went on to say something about how creative creativity, or, or, or what have you, is not provided for in the capitalist system because you work for someone. Again, I think I've kind of handled that idea. You work with someone, not for someone. You may have a supervisor, you may have a boss, but that's so that the process can go smooth. And guess what? In the capitalist system, ideally, if you do a good enough job, and if you get more skill, you'll eventually be the boss yourself. So it's not a, it's not a caste system or anything like that. Um, but like. Have you seen the esports industry, which is largely unregulated? In fact, Josh Hawley of, I forgot what the state he represents, he is largely calling for the regulated. The esports industry is a $1 billion industry. And you know what, you know where it comes from? It comes from 14 year old kids who decide to play a game and decide to make a profit off of it. Creative expression is quite a lie, even in our corrupted capitalist system right now, our crony capitalist system. And guess what? If we embrace that, uh, the spiritual truth of a pure capitalist system, then I promise you it would unleash even more. But it's already alive. It's, it's prima facie, it's evident, and I think that it would do both of us good to recognize that. Thank you. I'll go to David's rebuttal. There was a lot to unpack there, actually. <laughs> um, Christian said that I am advocating for a particular economic or political system, and while it is true that I did use as a lot of uh, the reference and the basis of my critique of capitalism several uh, Marxist thinkers, including Karl Marx himself, I do not recall uh, a single statement that I made in favor or advancing a certain political or economic state. Um, I understand why Christian uh, assumes that I am in favor of socialism or communism in the manner of the former Soviet Union or in uh, the modern day People's Democratic Republic of Korea or in the People's Republic of China. Um, but, and if I may, a statement in support of those uh, top down hierarchical Stalinist desk institutions, uh, please let me know so I may correct myself and disavow um, those political and economic systems. Um, Christian made the point that Karl Marx did not recognize distinctions. Uh, I, do, I, I do not think that could be further from the truth. If you read Karl Marx's 1844 Paris Manuscripts, he really lays out his ethical system and the reason he believes uh, what, he, what he believes and why he, uh, what are the ethical foundations for his critique of the capitalist system. Karl Marx, represents, his kind of thought uh, represents, for me and many other thinkers, the culmination of individualistic thought. I know that comes as a surprise to the Christian who believes um, that only capitalism can allow for the advancement of the individual. Karl Marx recognized that every human being is different, so we each have our own individual creative capacities, our own individual reasons, and our own individual wants and desires. For Marx, the problem was the current capitalist system does not provide a framework where individuals can act on their demands. How much time do you have to philosophize, philosophize, to think, to engage in art and architecture, uh, to engage in you know, basic pastimes, fishing, hunting, etc., if you are constrained at a factory, working very long hours, working not for yourself but on behalf of someone else who then takes uh, part of your productivity and gives you back a portion of it in the form of wages. Um, what 
capitalism does in this instance is reduce every single individual purely to their productive contribution to the uh, bourgeoisie, to the owners of the means of production, and the worker is reduced purely to a wage that needs to be paid, never recognized as an individual in and of itself. And that, for me, is why I will never be able to accept capitalism, because I know that I made several economic arguments tonight, um, and I believe those arguments are important. But what underpins my economic arguments is a firm belief in an ethical system which values um, the inherent worth of every individual. And I think Immanuel Kant said it best when he said, uh, every human being, by his very nature, or her very nature, he didn't say his, but now he was sick because of her very nature. Um, because we could rest beyond that point. Uh, every human being has or is an end in and of itself. And any system that treats human beings simply as a means to a different to, to an end outside of that person, um, that is an unethical system and denying that person individual an individuality and a free um, existence beyond that other end. I fail to see how capitalism does not treat individuals simply as means to an end, as means um, to profit. And on that note, I will yield to questions from the audience, and I anticipate many of some questions. All right, so for q and A, I'm actually going to stand right there. So if y'all want to uh, start lining up up that uh, that uh, side of the, the stairs, just kind of head down. Um, we're going we're gonna to try to get everyone's questions in, so we're going to limit questions to, to one minute and, and one question each. Um, you have a minute to formulate that question, and that uh, one will have you wrap it up or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'll be holding the mic for you guys. And uh, again, you can address it to Christian, you can address it to David or both. Um, but yeah, I'll meet you guys over on that side if you, if you guys have any questions. Uh, so my first question is to Christian. Uh, you, you made clear in your opening statement that the foundation of your argument rests on a distinction between capitalism and crony capitalism. And you make clear that your distinction rests on capitalism really being an unencumbered, free exchange, voluntary exchange of you know, materials and transactions, and crony capitalism being the government uh, obstruction of that. Um, as Mr. Stokes pointed out, uh, inherently the state is necessary for capitalism to work because the state is necessary to prevent, uh, protect private property. Um, additionally to that, Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, noted that in the disputes between labor and disputes of what he called masters, or what we might not call uh, people with wealth, uh, the law tends to side on the favor of people with wealth. Uh, so I want to understand, uh, I want to resolve this tension in that how do you guarantee, as we've seen, wealth's t uh, tendency to encroach on the markets, to make them more unfair for uh, wealth to try and influence the government to make the system work more in its favor, and if you suggest intervening to stop that through regulations to prevent what you call you know crony capitalism or uh, present, uh, preventing the the effects of people with this wealth, how is that intervention not then also a form of crony capitalism where the government's getting involved? So let me make something incredibly clear before I answer this question. No amount or form of government regulation in the market is ever acceptable, period. None, zilch, ever. So, now we got that out of the way, I think, there are, first of all, there are a lot of things in the back of that question. First of all, I think that the sort of argument from authority, Adam Smith said it, therefore it must be. Um, Adam Smith was a brilliant guy. Wealth Nation is one of the most brilliant political treaties I've read in my life. But guess what? He also endorsed labor for theory of value as well. Adam Smith is not a god. He is not inviolable. No man or human is inviolable, and he, and, and he was not the father of capitalism. He simply articulated a capitalist vision in part, in a, in a, in a way better than the folks before him did, and folks that came after him did it better than him. So we kept building on that foundation. So I'm not entirely sure why Smith's word should be treated as gospel truth. It should not. Smith is a man like any, anyone else who happened to be well-learned, well-studied, and that's it. So I'm not, I'm not going to bow before the altar of Adam Smith and sing praises to him and do the rights or whatever. Adam Smith was a man who died a long time ago, brilliant, but there have been folks who have done things better than him. Um, 
And so you asked about credit capitalism, correct? Um, so I think your idea of wealth is very wrong, definitionally in incorrect. Wealth is not this static quantity that is shifted between class to class that can be measured almost perfectly by sociologists, by some sort of social ruler, uh, ruler measurement stick that we can then thereby determine arbitrarily what is fair and what not is fair. Wealth is a dynamic quantity which exists and is created continuously and, 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 and abundantly in a capitalist system. So this idea that, uh, but there's no, I, I agree with you, there, there is indeed a sort of, wealth does indeed have, a, have an influence on politics. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. I think that anyone should be able to use their voice or the resources however they want to be, however they want to use. And those who tend to balance money as opposed to principles, that shows a, a, a moral deficit within them as opposed to moral deficit within the system. So if the system allows me to go out there and speak to someone and you know say something to someone, the system is not compelling me to cheat them. The system is not compelling me to be dishonest. All the system is doing is giving me the opportunity to, to exercise my free will. And if my free will is to try to cheat politicians with money, guess what? Guess what? That's me, not the system. So I think that there are a lot of things going on in that question, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how it really, how it all seems together and to sort of go here and on. Sure. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that so my question is for David, and if I was a participant in this, this debate, it might be considered somewhat of an abusive question, but I'm not, so I'm gonna ask it. Um, if you're not advocating for capitalism and you're not advocating for socialism or communism, what exactly would you advocate for? Because it seems to me you want to access the benefits of a free market, but you don't want to advocate capitalism, and it seems to me it's really difficult to do both of those things. Thank you, Madison, for the question. The, in my opening statement, I drew a distinction between capitalism and the free market, and I also tried to establish this in my questioning with um, Christian during the first public battles. The market has always existed as long as human beings have existed and trade, trade with one another. The very first two or three humans that got together and that exchanged uh, food or crops or tools or whatever they had at the time, that was a market. So, capital, so the, the market is not intrinsic to capitalism. Capitalism did not invent uh, the markets. The market existed through uh, Roman times and feudal times, up through the, the evolution, up until the present day. Um, what capitalism does differently is that it deals with the market in a way differently than other historical systems have done, and that is uh, use the markets for the endless accumulation of profit. Until the Industrial Revolution, it was not really possible to produce things on a level um, that you could, could actually endlessly produce profit and endlessly replicate um, capital. As I also said, uh, this replication of capital, this drive to endlessly accumulate profits, uh, by definition, or not uh, necessarily, uh, creates a distinction on those who have property, those who have capital, and those who do not. And as soon as this distinction is made, I would argue, the market ceases to be free. If you cannot um, enter the market on your own terms because you don't have property, if you cannot participate in the market as an individual, but only as a laborer, or as someone who is contributing labor, um, but not necessarily benefiting from that labor as you should. That is an unfree market, and capitalism uh, intrinsically creates an unfree market to, to perpetuate itself. Um, I know that I'm here to debate against the resolution, but there actually is one part of the resolution that I quite like, and that is the last uh, three or four lines, which is devised by uh, man, or devised by uh, humankind, I would prefer. Um, and this is absolutely true. Capitalism is not inevitable. It never was inevitable. Uh, historical forces combined to bring it out to its current state. Um, but it, is, it doesn't exist in and of itself. It, it, it exists because humans as a society have uh, come together and basically determined among themselves this is how the economy is going to function. And um, we're also going to take our guns and ships and go and conquer the world and everyone else, uh, capitalists, just like us. And because it is devised by man, it can be changed. It can be changed by humans if we uh, decide to. It does not represent the inevitable pinnacle of human development. 
Um, and I would argue that it is possible to change system from within, not to that argument, that every historical system uh, from itself creates the preconditions for the next historical system. For instance, during feudal times, the middle class emerged from the class struggle of uh, landowners and serfs. Uh, they eventually became the bourgeois and created the establishment of capitalism. Capitalism is not inevitable. It's not the end all be all. It's certainly not uh, the end of history. That doesn't mean that every type of uh, critique of capitalism or alternative economic system that has been devised against it is a valid system that I would support. Just because I have critiqued capitalism doesn't mean that I will immediately accept uh, whichever is the net system to come around to replace it. And I certainly uh, will not accept as a model um, hierarchical top-down command economic systems like Stalinism um, that came to power in the Soviet Union and much of the um, Soviet bloc. For capitalism, as I said, is not the free market, and so it, is, it must be uh, essential that we return to the free market and abandon capitalism. Um, and for me, that requires abolishing the division of property, in short. Okay, if I might respond a little, little bit, of course. You can uh, so I just wanted to make exceptionally clear the historical record to show that someone else showed this. A market existed back in those days of Rome, back in those days of, of, of almost, uh, of not prehistory, but ancient times, right? A market existed back when the colonialists were around. A market. When you say the market, you therefore exclude every other market or every other possibility of a market from the equation, and you try to make it, a, you make it seem as if the same market existed continuously throughout time, and that's just not true. So I just want to make it clear that A market existed. The free market is really really a new advent of the of, of 21st century, or 20th, 20th century, so to speak, 20th, late 19th century, and that should really be acknowledged for what it is. Uh, I, will, I will respond briefly. Um, I want to keep emphasizing that capitalism, I'm not denying that capitalism changed the markets. And I actually uh, said that when I said that capitalism changed the markets and made its purpose the endless accumulation of uh, capital or profit. And so I'm not saying that um, capitalism didn't change the market, use the market in different ways, whether so the market that exists today uh, is the best model or is the model that comes from historical markets. But markets do exist every time people, people, people meet. And the form of the market is socially determined because we have decided this is how the market is going to be. Because we have decided it and determined it, we can change it. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I missed this part, but you, I remember a main point of your argument, Mr. David, was that capitalism creates like a wealth gap to where there's people that enter the market as just laborers, but how would there be a system that would prevent people from entering the market? Just labor. Uh, thank you. And what was your name? Corbin. Corbin? Yes. Uh, so, the reason that we have capitalists and workers is because of the division of property and the fact that some individuals do not own the means of production. So, for me, the answer to your question is quite simple uh, abolishing the private ownership of the means of production. Uh, if everyone owns the means of production, then everyone has something to contribute beyond just skill labor. They can contribute um, and engage with um, commonly owned means of production. And that would, by definition, make, make everyone, um, if everyone, if everyone owns the means of production and everyone receives their fair share from the means of production, then that means that everyone is benefiting from the full amounts of their actual uh, productive value in society. So that, so that would be awesome to answer. <laughs> um, so, again, this is a basic Marxian axiom, not, no, not definitely not an axiom, basic Marxian principle. And really, I mean, you, number one, you have to define what fair share means. Number two, you have, to, you have to account for scarcity, which Marx never does, which will perhaps interrupt your ability to have a quote-unquote fair share. Uh, number three, you'll have to exactly justify how making people the same in a legal sense, property is a legal right, in a legal sense, 
makes them the same in a philosophical or universal or principle sense, i.e. it does not. And you would have to really make the case that people are entirely socially motivated, they are entirely a product of their social environment, which is, as we understand, not necessarily the case. So almost, and that's a very brief sort of explanation of the kind of principles you're espousing, but almost in any, by any single metric, any um, plurality of metrics, what you're saying is just not feasible or it's philosophically untrue. So, uh, I mean, So this question is for Christian. Uh, and you had the analogy or metaphor or whatever rhetorical tool you were using. Um, so you brought up a hospital with a janitor and a brain surgeon. Um, I think it's a fairly simple question. Why is the janitor in a benevolent system working less than the surgeon? He's not. But you said he that at some point in the analogy, you acknowledged that he was making less his work was less. So let me pose a question to you, my friend. If someone's work determined, if someone's work determined by how much they're paid, the capitalistic system definitely says no. I'm not sure what system you follow or what you say, but I think that human beings are more than the dollar amount they get in their bank account. And so is capitalism, which is why it gives them a chance to ascend and get better than they are in the current state. So that janitor theoretically has the ability to accrue more material value if he wants to. But it has, has absolutely nothing about his value as a human being. The two things, getting paid and having value as a human being, are fundamentally, existentially separated, both in the capitalist system. They are one and the same because the capitalist system allows you to use your will, which is a part of your value as a human being, to manifest and materialize abundance in material, in, in, in material ways, in material means, i.e. money. But no, Dander's value is completely independent of his standing in the capitalist system. And completely independent. Undo it. Um, so this question is also a question, um, and I feel like it's partly more of a clarification as to me maybe misunderstanding, but I, I know that you are arguing in favor of capitalism being benevolent and efficient, right? Yes. But you also, at the beginning, were talking about crony capitalism, and you're not arguing in favor of crony capitalism. Did I understand that correctly? Okay. Um, so then, in that sense, it seems to me, and maybe it's just me not being ignorant or not knowing, but as far as I know, there are no examples, or there's no existence of pure capitalism. Like, there's no country that is 100% purely capitalist. And it seems that a lot of the examples that you were giving um, throughout the debate between the two of you, you were giving examples from the United States, even historically, even though you yourself argued that, you know, the, the example that we live in is purely capitalism. So I guess my question is, it seems as though you're going throughout history, picking good examples from crony capitalism, saying these are the benefits of capitalism, but then saying, but also all the bad stuff, because then you also named like inequality and everything else at the beginning, and you're saying, well, all that bad stuff is crony capitalism. That's not what I'm arguing for. <coughs> all the good stuff is pure capitalism. That is what I'm arguing for. So if you could clarify that for me. Sure, I would love to. Um, so when I mentioned inequality and things of that sort, I was mentioning them in the sense of them being used as, as rhetorical critiques against capitalism. I will be, I will be on the record, I don't really care who doesn't like it, I think inequality is one of the best things that we have as human beings. I think me being able to be separated, like for example, I will never be one of the greatest basketball stars who just passed away, broke my heart, Kobe Bryant, I will never be that. My height's not there, my bodily composition's not there, it's just not there, the looks aren't there, it's just not there. But, but, I have my own value in my own way, which allows me to be uniquely myself, and that's what the capitalist system enhances and, and, and reflects. So I don't have to be like Jamal, like Kobe, or, 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 like, or, like, or like Barack, or like anyone else. I can be Christian Watson, I can be just as good right here, in my own skin, in my own space, in my own time, as anyone else would be. That's why I think capitalism is one of the best systems ever. But um, yeah, just, and also to clarify about the sort of, um, the other stuff you mentioned, about the, uh, I, I, I did indeed mention the uh, corner capitalism and examples. So I'm not necessarily called to give you a material example of capitalism completely 100% working. I'm not called to do that because this is a conceptual debate. The resolution says 
Capitalism is the most benevolent and efficient economic system ever conceived by man. I have to show you that the conception thereof is benevolent and efficient, and that has made its way in some, in some cases. I don't have to show you that the, the totality of a country has bowed down the conception. I don't have to do that, because it's conceptual big. But I do indeed believe and think, and the, and the historical record compares this out, there are perhaps smaller indeed examples of pure capitalism working. Greenwood Tulsa, again, Black Wall Street. This was, a, this was perhaps one of the most successful African-American settlements in the history of the country, or well, history of the country in that, at that point in time, it was a slave colony. And it quite literally had zero regulations, had tax services, had airplanes, had everything, restaurants, everything. Of course, it was burnt down by a bunch of arsonists who didn't really believe in the capitalist individualist model, but that's their fault, that's their, that's, their, that's, their, that's their issue. The system worked perfectly for those freed slaves in that period of time. And so, and on smaller levels, or not even smaller, but on more concentrated levels, you have indeed seen a, the evidence of capitalism, pure capitalism, being successful. For an entire country to adopt it would take a cultural shift. And these debates, in my opinion, are part of shepherding that cultural shift to the altar and, and officiating it. And so, just because you haven't seen something that's quite as I'm talking about and a broader level does not mean it cannot be replicated. I don't think that the entire impracticality argument, whether it be against communism or whatever, it's illogical to me. I don't care if it hasn't been done before. I want to know, can it be done? And the answer for capitalism is that 100% yes, it can emphatically be done. No country that is considered developed today got there on, on capitalist, purely capitalist principles as Christian has expounded them. Um, because I disagree with the definition of capitalism, and that's maybe a lot of the reason why we don't, uh, why we don't agree um, tonight. Um, the Fraser Institute, which is a libertarian think tank, has a ranking of many, uh, I think actually every country, um, and evaluates them in terms of economic freedom in a way that I, I'm assuming Christian would find. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and no country on that list has a score above nine. The highest country that is on that list is uh, Hong Kong, which is um, for the for, for economic freedom and that's it's usually sort of separate from mainland China. And Hong Kong has a, a rating of eight, which is not 10, I'll remind you. Um, so no country that we said developed or, or is in the OECD has gotten there by purely adopting uh, capitalist um, methods. There's always been state intervention in the economy, assisted by colonialism and taking results from other countries and state intervention in the economy at home to protect the industries until they grow and get strong and then flood uh, the, the developing world or the global south or the periphery, however you want to call it this part of the world. Um, with the manufactured goods and destroy local industries. These are all state uh, interventions in the economy, and all states that are developed today have employed them, and no state that is currently considered developed has used purely capitalist means to get there. And the Fraser Institute admits this by not doing any country above between the nine. Um, on the ranking system. I, I must briefly respond to that. Um, so the Fraser Institute, I'm very familiar, the Economic Freedom Index measures degrees, not totalities. So they measure how far these companies, how far these countries, so to speak, uh, in comparison or against other countries, against the, co the current actually dominant mean of how most countries are, which as you say, yes, are very state interventions. That's all it says. It does not say that capitalism, pure capitalism, it's not a very efficient or viable means of getting these, these areas. It, it says the most capitalism that we have right now in certain areas, this is, this is how fully economic success. So if you look at it that way, and which is, I think, is the most intuitive way to look at it, it would seem to me that the more people liberalize their economies, the, the more prosperous the they become. Look at China. Look at what China did. China is now one of the most, like, one of the global centers of the world. You know, it, it didn't get there by adopting Mao's sort of agrarian communist idea. It got there by getting by shedding a lot of that. Not that China's not all, all that free economy entirely, but it still has gotten gone a very long way, and it boomed in the process. So imagine what China would happen to China if China completely not really shed its regulatory skin. They let people trade more, free more. Imagine the tariffs on America without. Imagine if the engine of human creativity was released. I would suspect 
it will be very amendable and very successful and very and very you know uh, coherent, coinciding with economic success. But you know, it's just because you know, there hasn't been a quote unquote purely capitalist country does not necessarily mean the system itself is inefficient or, or is not reliable. In fact, what it means when we measure people that are closest, closely or closely related to the pur purely capitalist idea and they're prospering, that shows us that there's success to be found in that idea and that is motivation to keep going on. On this uh, very quick Uh, you, you mentioned China as a, as a model of economic liberalism leads to greater growth and prosperity. Um, a little bit, you know, and you said that it was because they rejected Mao Zedong thought and adopted uh, this what they called Jinping thought. Well, the more, the more yeah, they still have some Zedong thought in their economy, but largely have liberalized and they have cut back on regulation just now. Well, that's not necessarily bringing greater prosperity to every person in China, that is bringing prosperity to the cronies, the elites, the Communist Party, cadre at the top, uh, the president is in a circle. Um, and this is again why I don't support systems like this, it's very top down, it's just replicating uh, capitalism in a different guise, it's state capitalists, all the proceeds and, and uh, profit and growth going to the top, and the Chinese lower classes are being shafted once again, um, but at the time it's called communism, and it is not something um, that I would to send it for. So I have a question for you, David. So what exactly is capitalism, and how is it different than a market? Because I don't really see the difference yet. Because capitalism isn't really like a system, it's a natural default. Nobody devised it, it just happened. And it's the product of rational choices. So, like, what is in existence if not capitalism? Capitalism and the free markets are not the same, even on a theoretical level. Um, as I as I as I've said before, in the free markets long-term profits are zero. And this is due to a variety of features, mainly because the consumer is not going to pay one cent more than what uh, they know from this charging to produce the product. So that's one of other reasons the long-term profit um, is zero. But yet this is what capitalists will call uh, a free market with perfect competition. It's a sort of ideal state theorized um, that is not replicated in real life. That's why it's theoretical. In real life, the capitalist market, as I said, um, is unfree. By, by definition, by, by providing barriers to the, uh, to the free entry and participation of everyone in it, um, and by state interventions as individuals. And, and if I remember correctly, you said the impression that, 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 that the free market of capitalism is the, the natural state. Yeah. Um, I don't think that argument really has a lot of weight. If you, if you were to take a time machine and go back throughout history and put yourself uh, in the Roman Empire and went to the Senate and talked to the patricians, they would of course say that the division of the economy in Roman times between the patrician class and the plebeian classes and the feudal, uh, feudal less ways that that is the natural state of man and that is how it will be forever and ever and all, up until eternity. And then it wasn't. Rome collapsed, the economy, the political system, and through a drastic um, change, and we had a new class of, of rulers, the, the feudal classes, who earned profits purely based on their ownership of land, and they oppressed the serfs, and the serfs were basically um, tied to the land as peasants, that the, 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 owners, the landowners would do what they wanted. And of course, the kings, and the lords, and the barons, and everyone in the system said that the feudal system is the natural state of man. God has decided that this is the way it's going to be. God has anointed. Um, Louis XIV is king, and he has chosen among himself his noble lords, and he has given them privileges and prerogatives, and this is the natural state of things. Until the wasn't. Um, you have the arrival of a slave economy in, in, in many parts of the United Continents, and during that time, uh, landowners in the South who owned slaves said that, well, this is the natural state of people. There are actual distinct race, uh, races, um, and there are intrinsic differences to these races, and the way that we have uh, white slave owners and African slaves, that is the natural system, that's how it ought to be, and that's how it always will be, until one day it wasn't. And now we have the capitalist system. Um, and you see these same arguments repeating themselves over history, um, 
and, and, and as you said, as people have said, capitalism represents the end of history. Every country in the world is coming to be like, like capitalism, and it's going to be um, the end of human development. And then one day, we're going to wake up, and we're going to find that it is not the case. The economy has gone uh, over a major shift, and has changed once again. So I would reject the notion that capitalism is a natural culmination of human development. Just very, very briefly, I just want to mention that the again, beautiful rhetoric. But I think the use of similar of arguments that appeal to nature that happen to purely be used in op for opportunism and for the accruement of political power, i.e., the Romans, i.e., the royals, i.e., all that kind of stuff, i.e., the barons, i.e., i.e., I, 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 the uh, the sort of the people who are at the top of the caste system, so to speak, should not be confused or even equated with arguments that from an objective standpoint, use a priori reasoning to try to gauge what exactly human nature is and how the capitalist system, how the system interacts with it. So it, just because someone set, said in the past, uh, it justified nature to do some terrible thing in the past, does not mean every argument from nature is a bad argument. So just, just from a purely argumentative standpoint. But to answer, to answer your question, capitalism absolutely is the natural conclusion, I think, of human creativity. Now, that does not mean it's the end of history. In fact, that's a very Spengler-esque idea. I don't think that history necessarily has an end. I think history keeps developing and goes on and on and on until it doesn't. Right? But I do think that capitalism is the conclusion of our eternal search for how to find both value and how to, and how to produce value in material ways. That does not necessarily mean it's in history, it just means it's the end of our, I think, humanity's very long quest to try to make sense of the world in a more concrete way, so to speak. And, yeah. Thanks. There was a part of the question that I didn't address, and um, my answer to that part will also address a little bit of, of what Christian just said. Um, capitalism is not, I keep repeating myself, it's not the inevitable conclusion, and the people that's who made it this way, the people who made it this way are the ruling classes of this age. The ones who control the media, the ones who control the governments, the ones who control um, the least sense of power. Even those who are engaged in cultural um, creations all reinforce this idea of class hegemony and the current economic system. And, and it's really it's, it's designed in a way to create a false consciousness among the proletariat. This is to use uh, Gramsci's language. Um, so there are architects to the system, and they are the ones who are in power. And they are constructed an elaborate system um, of intellectuals, of pundits, of talking heads, of politicians um, who are out there to convince the public that this is the way that, that this is the way human nature ought to be. And I simply disagree um, with their arguments from nature, as Christian puts it. Just very, very briefly, I, th I think that this, uh, just very briefly, I want to be able to get the most out of this conversation, and I think that addressing each other's points is the best way to do that. So I'm sorry to signal a little long, but this is, this is how long the conversation works. So, this, this very conspiratorial notion, which comes, this comes straight from Das Kapital, comes straight from Marx's rhetoric. I mean, this is really nothing all that different. This conspiratorial notion that there is this grand collective hive mind within the political echelon of society that is actively prodding us to believe certain things is nonsense. If you look at the, the administration of power right now, you would see that. If you look at any political pundit, you would see that. If you look at anyone, Individuals have differences, individual different motivations, and I think that since you have access to the information, Mr. Stokes, I think that it's more, more than likely. A lot of folks who are, have, have, uh, who are very educated and very intelligent have already made certain points in society, also indeed have access to this sort of information, and they would not let themselves be manipulated by some, some amorphous, uh, some scary, nefarious, unknown, unseen proletar uh, bourgeoisie that is controlling everything. And plus, the notion, that notion about the qualification is not really an argument at all. It's just a conspiratorial music which really should not be considered when we're talking about principled conversations. Um, so, this question is for David. Um, earlier you mentioned that you envisioned a system where uh, work could be done for purely creative means. And I'm just wondering, like, why do you think that's how do you think that's productive? How do you think that's realistic? And could you also give me like an example of like any time and point in history where like you would really um, sorry, I'm trying to word this correctly. Uh, is there any time and point in history where you, you could point to a country or a place or whatever 
and say like that's that's what I would want and like that's the best thing. Human society is in a constant state of evolution and progression, I would argue. And so there's not a historical example that I would point to um, when where my ideas have been conflicted in the way that I uh, would foresee them. Um, but that is not to say that because something doesn't exist or has never existed, that it can't exist. At, at, there was a time before the French and American revolutions that people were saying that the public and democracies uh, could not exist. The capitalism itself uh, could not exist. And yes, drastic changes took place. Um, people with ideas took the means of power to implement those ideas and created something uh, that was brand, uh, brand new. What was, what was the first question? It's the final. Um, I was asking how it could be like productive and... <laughs> I was asking like, how would your idea of um, people working purely for like creative purposes, like how would that be productive and why and like how does that make sense to you as opposed to capitalism? <clears throat> Karl, one of the biggest failings of Karl Marx, and this is happen, criticizing uh, Karl Marx, is oh. that <laughs> Uh, is that he's not very uh, clear in how he envisions the post-capitalist society uh, to take place. He talks in very broad terms about the creation of the proletariats and about the transitional period and everything. Nothing very clear. And this is why we have uh, really intense debates on the left about what we actually mean um, by this thing. And if you've ever been, and if this is a very cultural conversation, if you get a bunch of leftists in a room with energy stabbing each other uh, within a very, very short period of time, because um, a lot of our founding figures were very vague. Um, they, they were much better at um, describing the current system and describing the normative um, sort of role for the new system. For, for me, I think it's really hard for us to conceptualize this new system because we are so used to capitalism and the capitalist measures of productivity in the form of money or, or an exchange or, 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 or anything else. Um, Slavoj Zizek talks about the, the optimal ideology. That capitalism is more of an economic system. It is an ideology that shapes and frames the way we view the world. So it's very hard to describe um, the system that uh, I would envision. And I actually, myself, am not entirely clear. Um, I'm still thinking about what I would prefer. So I can't really give a clear answer at this time. Um, but there are plenty of ideas that I've heard of. Um, in terms of productivity, there's a really interesting argument that has come out in the past you know, 10 or 15 years that uh, changes in technology and the way that the economy functions, going for remote tech, um, and the electronics, and AI will eventually make human labor um, for our subsistence completely irrelevant because of technological changes. Humans will not have to work as machines to do it for us. I'm not necessarily so uh, fully on this idea. It perhaps has, has merit that should consider previous or more, more work, but I really can't give you a solid answer to your question because it hasn't been envisioned yet. When someone makes this, then we'll be able to talk about it. Uh, can I make a quick recommendation to people that are living in with him? Just a short. Uh, I'll ask one there. I mean, there's signatures still. Uh, this is kind of a broad question, so make sure it's best as you can. Um, I really enjoyed the theory of this, but I also enjoyed the application. So, one of the, some of the main ideas we talked about were people and ideas and systems. And if there's anything that I've learned, it's that uh, although human essence can be a very beautiful thing, it can also be a very scary thing as people pursue uh, well power. So, this question is for both of you. How would you suggest protecting um, ideas from the people who want to corrupt the systems that those ideas are predicated on? You know, whether capitalist or socialist, communist, whatever. So I'll just be very brief. You do that for a reason. So reason has been, I think, mankind. And when I say mankind, one of, 
Women were originally included in the original definition of the word as well, so I'm not going to be politically correct in the reason. Uh, I think that reason has been mankind's foremost defense against charlatans, against tricksters, against hucksters, against folks who have tried to cheat people out of every single thing they have gained. And uh, it's, been our, it's been our foremost defense against sophistry, sophistry in the ancient Greece. Sophists were folks who would twist their arguments around and argue both, both sides of the issue would actually manipulate the meaning of principles and concepts and use those to confuse the public consciousness. And then, of course, when Plato would ever get into a conversation with them about reason, they wouldn't be able to, to stand up. So you must use reason, which everyone else, everyone in, in the world, everyone here in this room has, uh, to fight against these kind of deficits of public consciousness. There is nothing that Christian just said that I take exception to. I think that we agree um, on the absolute importance of uh, the flow of ideas and information. Um, I, as I said before, I believe that humans are, have, a, have an essence that is beyond subsistence, that is inherently creative. It would not make any sense for me to argue that humans are inherently creative and then argue for some sort of system uh, but wants to police or restrict or in any ways uh, oppress human creativity. So I would be a Christian that uh, the use of reason and being informed and being able to think for yourself are really important and to keep any ideas. Uh, that we can agree at least. Hi, so uh, this question is for David. I uh, attended this to hear about how capitalism is the most benevolent and efficient economic system ever created by man. I've heard you reference the free market a couple of times as something different uh, than capitalism. I also heard you say that you disavow communist communism, such as the Soviet Union, but I've yet to hear you comment on the effectiveness of an economic system that capitalism is, or list a more benevolent system. I heard earlier in another question you referencing that you wouldn't know yet, it hasn't been thought up on how to implement the free society. So I guess my question is, if you're arguing that capitalism is not the most benevolent and efficient economic system ever, what would be the most benevolent and economic? Because I heard lots of dancing around the question with your actual response. So, I, I understand the confusion. I criticize both uh, capitalism as it is theorized and put in practice, and I've also criticized um, Stalinist type dictatorships and command economies that pass themselves off as socialists. Um, I find it quite interesting that both Christian and I disavow all systems as put in practice. Christian disavows crony capitalism, which he sees as a corruption of capitalism, pure capitalism, which he sees it, and I disavow. Um, Socialism as is manifested as a corruption um, of what I would regard as pure socialism. For, for I, I would define socialism not as a vertical, uh, like a vertical relationship. It is, in my opinion, definitionally a horizontal relationship. So any introduction of, of vertical power hierarchies, um, institutions, structures, etc., um, that are coercive, I would be opposed to that system. So if you would have try to put me in a box ideologically. Um, again, I'm still in a formative period and trying to uh, discover my own um, political thinking. That's one of the great virtues of a great college paper program and being in the university in general. Um, but if you want to put me in an ideological box to a specific time and the people trying to leave, I would probably fit more in a left-wing libertarian ideology. Um, so we call it anarchism. I think that's a, a, a distraction to call it that. But left-wing libertarianism, I, Based on what I've read, I don't have many complaints about it. Last question. I suppose it is that. Do I have to use this? Can y'all hear me? I don't really want to use this. I always embarrass myself on microphones. Okay, so my question is for Christian. Um, and this theme has kind of been danced around, not really touched on, but a little bit. Um, so you define true capitalism as the unfettered exchange of goods, services, and value, right? Um, right. Yeah. E either way, similar. Um, I would argue that to encounter a truly unfettered exchange, we would have to regress ridiculously far 
perhaps even to like the time of the cave people, if that, right? So the reason being that from the beginning of society, peoples were subjugating other peoples. For example, women have historically been or have consistently been subjugated by men. And the justification I often hear by capitalists is that biologically women are weaker than men, right? So, no. Um, okay, but I, I'm not arguing that you're saying that. I'm saying that I've heard that justification. Okay, I have a piece of this in here. Okay, so um, I often hear advocacy for private property from capitalists. I believe you yourself advocated for it. But I never hear the capitalist reconciliation between advocacy for private property and subjugation of people based on their worth in the eyes of the capitalist system. So as David said, each individual has worth as an individual. How do you reconcile these two realities? Well, I find it quite simple given the fact that the capitalistic mindset, the capitalistic spirit was never embodied in any instance of subjugation or oppression of anyone other than a mutable characteristic. In fact, capitalism does not care about minimal characteristics. Capitalism cares about merit. Capitalism cares about what you can necessarily, for how much value you can give. And those two things are not necessarily linked into things you were born with, things you cannot change. So, uh, but this, you have a sort of Foucaultian idea here. It's quite interesting. The sort of Foucaultian idea of history is just a long line of oppressions. And those oppressions just culminate into the modern system. And, and the problem with this viewpoint is the same problem that Foucault, a lot of Foucault uh, posteriors has. It's simply that it does not account for other things. It has a singular viewpoint, a singular prism. Uh, and singular prisms are oftentimes not the best way to measure complex issues. In fact, they are definitionally not the best way to measure complex issues. So yes, have women been treated terribly throughout history? Indeed, and, that's, and that was terrible. And have, have, have blacks been treated terribly throughout history? Hey, have gays been treated terribly throughout history? Absolutely they have. And guess what? The moment they were able to get into a system, into a space, where they were able to exercise their energy and their wills vis-a-vis -vis the voluntary mechanisms of capitalism, they have fought back and they have fought back successfully. Look at the course work in the 80s. When, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, when, when, when the course company was doing the same thing as about gay, look how they fought back. They fought back with their pocketbooks and course was forced to their knees to change their rhetoric. Look at almost any major boycott and how it was used to engineer social change, both social and spiritual change, social in terms of how people perceive each other, and spiritual in terms of how mindsets change. Capitalism is literally the vehicle to fighting against expression. And if you don't believe me, you can look at the numerous examples, you can just evaluate the, the concept in principle. Um, so there is absolutely no link between capitalism and oppression. And there's absolutely no link between capitalism and the disempowerment of people. Capitalism views everyone in the same light with a single standard, and that is the definition of the equality that folks were denied systemically for years. Anytime you have a small minority of people trying to force their views or their will or their way of life on a majority of people, it becomes absolutely essential for that small elite's uh, class to find a way to divide and conquer the vast majority of people they intend to subjugate. And that, I think, is exactly uh, what has happened historically with the advent um, of the capitalist rule economy. Um, you have a very small elite group of those who own the means of production, the bourgeoisie, trying to oppress the proletariat. I know that Christian doesn't like um, this language, but I think that, you know, and, and there are problems with, it, with the strict collocation um, of class, but I think in all theoretical terms, uh, it is fair to say that they do exist classes of people. Um, so if you are the bourgeoisie, you're trying to uh, keep the proletariats from pulling out their pitchforks and burning your factories to the ground, you find any way you can to divide them. And that can either be uh, gender, it can be race, it can be based on religion, it can be based on um, any sort of uh, intrinsic factors or human identity or the way people define um, themselves. And this is why Marxists and those inspired by Marx have always been at the forefront um, of activism to overcome these tensions, to overcome these fake creations, these fake boundaries between people based on physical characteristics, sexual orientation, um, identity, race, religion, etc., and to unify people and make mass um, trans sectarian, trans ethnic, etc., read uh, movements. Because it is all about power and divide and rule. Um, 
I'll make two good points just to conclude. Um, so uh, this idea that capitalism is a part of the divide and conquer, the, the, the pitting up identities against each other, that makes no sense. Again, capitalism does not see identity. Capitalism sees one thing, it sees merit, it sees the value, the merit, value that merit produces. It does not see identity, it does not see anything immutable. It sees merit, and merit is independent of all those things. So for, from a conceptual level, I think you're wrong. And to suggest, I think you just suggested, seriously, I have, that Marxists have not tried to use identities or characteristics of what which are immutable to pit others against each other when that is quite literally the apex, the foundation of the dialectical materialism that forms the foundation of Marxism and that is quite literally how Leninism, how Stalinism, how most Marxist-inspired revolutions, whatever you feel that they are, how Marxist they are or not, most Marxist-inspired revolutions quite literally use to accumulate power, they use class warfare and conflict based off of immutable things and things that were collectively measured and not individually measured. So by your own standards, Marxist and the, and the, and the sort of theology you're using are not only incorrect in their estimation of capitalism, they're also incorrect in how they have gotten the power in the past as well. So I think that we need to be as we need to be as clear as possible about that. We need to recognize that Marxists are not saviors. They are in fact the sowers of this class conflict. They are in fact the creators of this paradigm of division and conflict. They are in fact the folks who view the world in this lens. Thankfully, the world does not work like this. Thankfully, classes are not things that we are, that we are divided into and that we are forever in eternal conflict at. Thankfully, the brotherhood of man exists and thankfully, Cooperation is the reason why each and every one of us is come in this room today and honor each other, and cooperation is the apex of capitalist system, which will allow humanity to unlock its destiny and ascend even beyond further as it has ascended already. Did, did I hear you claim that, okay, actually, enough of that approach. Um, I would disagree that Marxists have used her so division based on immutable um, features because class is not an immutable Well, I said feature. both immutable and things that are social. So I said both class and immutable things. Okay. That's just wrong. <laughs> so it is true that Marx bases uh, his view of history as a struggle between classes. But these classes are not set in stone and they change. And that is the point. And so what's, uh, the question that Mina was asking was, how does capitalism, if I understand the question correctly that you were asking is, how does capitalism uh, contribute to the oppression of people based on their immutable, intrinsic uh, identities such as race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. cetera. Um, things that restrict the benefit of flow, um, of, of ideas and values in some sort of systems. I remain committed to my statement that Marxism has, has always sought to rise above these sort of immutable, intrinsic differences, which don't um, really, which are, not, which are not real differences between people. The only difference between people is a difference of power. And that's really what defines the class system. It's, it's how much power you have over the economy, how much power you have over others. And that is not intrinsic, it changes all the time. Um, so I, I would disagree with your statement. I think with that, uh, I think there's a... Thank you guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.